Hello, this is the next part of Longfellow's Tales of a Wayside Inn. Okay. We're now up to the Spanish Jews' Tale, which is the legend of Rabbi Ben Levi. Rabbi Ben Levi on the Sabbath read the volume of the law in which it said, no man shall look upon my face and live. And as he read, he prayed that God would give his faithful servant grace with mortal eye to look upon his face and yet not die. Then fell a sudden shadow on the page, and lifting up his eyes, grown dim with age, he saw the angel of death before him stand holding a naked sword in his right hand. Rabbi Ben Levi was a righteous man, yet through his veins a chill of terror ran. With trembling voice he said, What wilt thou hear? The angel answered, Lo, the time draws near when thou must die. Yet first, by God's decree, whate'er thou askest shall be granted thee. Replied the rabbi, Let these living eyes first look upon my place in paradise. Then said the angel, Come with me and look. Rabbi Ben Levi closed the sacred book, and rising and uplifted his grey head, Give me thy sword, he to the angel said, lest thou shouldst fall upon me by the way. The angel smiled and hastened to obey, then led him forth to the celestial town, and set him on the wall, whence gazing down, Rabbi Ben Levi, with his living eyes, might look upon his place in paradise. Then straight into the city of the Lord, the rabbi leapt with death angel's sword, and through the streets there swept a sudden breath of something there unknown which men call death. Meanwhile, the angel stayed without and cried, Come back. To which the rabbi's voice replied, No, in the name of God whom I adore, I swear that hence I will depart no more. Then all the angels cried, O oh, holy one, see what the son of Levi here hath done. The kingdom of heaven he takes by violence, and in thy name refuses to go hence. <coughs> the Lord replied, My angels be not wroth, did e'er the son of Levi break his oath. Let him remain, for he with mortal eye shall look upon my face, and yet not die. Beyond the outer wall the angel of death heard the great voice and said with panting breath, Give back the sword and let me go. Whereat the rabbi paused and answered, Nay, anguish enough already hath it caused among the sons of men. And while he paused, he heard the awful mandate of the Lord resounding through the air. Give back the sword. The rabbi bowed his head in silent prayer. Then said he to the dreadful angel, Swear, no human eye shall look on it again, but 
When thou takest away the souls of men, myself unseen and with an unseen sword, thou wilt perform the bidding of the Lord. The angel took the sword again and swore, and walks on earth unseen for evermore. Continued. He ended, and a kind of spell upon the silent listeners fell. His solemn manner and his words had touched the deep, mysterious chords that vibrate in each human breast alike, but not alike confess. The spiritual world seemed near, and close above them the fall of fear, its awful adumbration passed. A luminous shadow, vague and vast. They almost forced to look, they almost feared to look, lest there, embodied from the impalpable air, they might behold the angel stand, holding the sword in his right hand. At last, but in a voice subdued, not to disturb their dreamy mood, said the Sicilian, A oh, while you spoke, telling your legends marvellous, suddenly my memory woke, the thought of one now gone from us. An old debate, meek and mild, my friend and teacher when a child, who sometimes in those days of old the legend of an angel told, which ran as I remember thus. The Sicilian's Tale, which is King Robert of Sicily. Robert of Sicily, brother of Pope Urbain, and Valmond, Emperor of Aramain, apparelled in magnificent attire with retinue of many a knight and squire, on St. John's Eve at Vespers proudly sat and heard the priests chant the Magnificat, and as he listened o'er and o'er again, repeated like a burden or refrain, he caught the words, Deposu et potentes de sede, et exaltavit humilies, and slowly sitting up his kingly head, he to a learned clerk beside him said, What mean those words? The clerk made answer mute. He has put down the mighty from their seat, and has exalted them of low degree. Thereat King Robert muttered scornfully, "'Tis well that such seditious words are sung, only by priests and in the Latin tongue, for unto priests and people be it known, there is no power can push me from my throne. And, leaning back, he yawned and fell asleep, lulled by the chant monotonous and deep. When he awoke, it was already night, the church was empty and there was no light, save where the lamps that glimmered few and faint lighted a little space before some saint. He started from his seat and gazed around, but saw no living thing and heard no sound. He groped towards the door, but it was locked. He cried aloud and listened, and then knocked, and uttered awful threatenings and complaints, and imprecations upon men and saints. The sounds re-echoed from the roof and walls, as if dead priests were laughing in their stores. At length the sexton without, from without, the tumult of knocking and the shout, and thinking thieves were in the house of prayer, came with his lantern, asking, Who is there? Half choked with rage, King Robert fiercely said, Open! Tis I, the king! Art thou afraid? The frightened sexton muttering with a curse, This is some drunken vagabond, or worse. Turned the great key and flung the portal wide, a man rushed by him with a single stride. Haggard, half-naked, without hat or cloak, who neither turned nor looked at him nor spoke, but leaped into the blackness of the night and vanished like a spectre from his sight. Robert of Sicily, brother of Pope Urbain and Valmond, Emperor of Anamain, despoiled of his magnificent attire, bareheaded, breathless, 
and be spranked with mire, with sense of wrong and outrage, desperate strode on and thundered at the palace gate, rushed through the courtyard, thrusting in his rage to right and left each seneschal and page, and hurried up the broad and sounding stair, his white face ghastly in the torch's glare. From hall to hall he passed with breathless speed, voices and cries he heard, but did not heed, until at last he reached the banquet room, blazing with light and breathing with perfume. There, on the dais sat another king, wearing his robes, his crown, his signet ring, King Robert's self in features, form and height, but all transfigured with angelic light. It was an angel, and his presence there, with a divine, divine effulgence, filled the air, an exultation piercing the disguise, though none were hidden, angel recognised. A moment speechless, motionless, and moved, the throneless monarch on the angel gazed, who met his look of anger and surprise with the divine compassion of his eyes. Then said, Who art thou, and why comest thou here? To which King Robert answered with a sneer, I am the king who come to claim my own from an impostor who usurps my throne. And suddenly, at these audacious words, up sprang the angry guests and drew their swords. The angel answered with unruffled brow, Nay, not the king, but the king's jester, thou. Henceforth shalt wear the bells and scalloped king, and for thy counsellor shalt lead an imp. Thou shalt obey my servants when they call, and wait upon my henchmen in the hall. Death to King Robert's threats and cries and prayers. They thrust him from the hall and down the stairs. A group of tittering pages ran before, and as they opened wide the folding door, his heart failed, for he heard with strange alarms the boisterous laughter of the men at arms, and all the vaulted chamber roar and ring with the rock plaudits of all live the him. Next morning, waking with the day's first beam, he said within himself, It was a dream. But the straw rustled as he turned his head, and there were the cap and bells beside him to his bed. Around him rose the bare discoloured walls, close by the steeds were champing in their stalls, and in the corner a revolting shape, shivering and chattering, set the ratchet in. It was no dream, the world he loved so much had turned to dust and ashes at his touch. Days came and went, and now and again, to Sicily the old Saturnian reign, under the angel's government benign, the happy, happy island danced with palm and wine, and deep within the mountain's burning breast, Enceladus the giant was at rest. Meanwhile, King Robert yielded to his fate, sullen and silent and disconsolate, dressed in the motley garb that jesters wear, with look bewildered and a vacant stare. Close shaven above the ears as monks are shorn, by courtiers mocked by pages laughed to scorn, his only friend, the ape. His only food, what others left, he still was unsubdued, and when the angel met him on his way, and half in earnest, half in jest, would say, sternly, though tenderly, that he might feel the velvet scabbard held a sword of steel, art thou the king? The passion of his woe burst from him in re resistless overflow, and, lifting high his forehead, he would fling the haughty answer back, I am, I am the king! Almost three years were ended, when there came ambassadors of great repute and name from Valmond, Emperor of Alamein, unto King Robert, saying that Pope Urbane, by letter, summoned them forthwith to come on Holy Thursday to his city of Rome, 
The angel with great joy received his guests and gave them presents of embroidered vests and velvet mantles with rich ermine lined and rings and jewels of the rarest kind. And then he departed with the royal of the city into the lovely land of Italy, whose loveliness was more resplendent made by the mere passing of that cavalcade, with plumes and cloaks and housings and the stir of jewel bridle and the golden spur. And lo, among the menials in mock state, upon a piebald steed with shambling gait, his cloak of foxtails flapping in the wind, his solemn ape demurely perched behind, King Robert rode, making huge merriment in all the country towns through which they went. The Pope received them with great pomp and glare, of bannered trumpets on St. Peter's Square, giving his benediction and embrace, fervent and full of apostolic grace. While well, with congratulations and with prayers he entertained the angel in the heavens. Robert, the jester, bursting through the crowd into their presence, rushed and cried aloud, I am the king, look and behold in me, Robert, your brother, king of Sicily. This man who wears my semblance to your eyes is an impostor in a king's disguise. Do you not know me? Does no voice within answer my cry and say we are a king? The Pope, in silence, but with troubled mane, gazed at the angel's countenance serene. The Emperor, laughing, said, It is a strange sport to keep a madman for thy forward court, and the poor baffled jester in disgrace was hustled back among the populace. In the solemn state the holy week went by, and the Easter Sunday gleamed upon the sky. The presence of the angel with its light before the sun rose made the city bright, and with new fervour filled the hearts of men who felt that Christ indeed had risen again. Even the jester on his bed of straw with haggard eyes the unwanted splendour saw. He felt within a power unfelt before, and kneeling humbly on his chamber floor, he heard the rushing garments of the Lord sweep through the silent air, ascending heavenward. And now, the visit ending, and once more Valmond returning to the damned shores, homeward the angel journeyed, and again the land was made resplendent with his train, flashing along the towns of Italy under Salerno, and from thence by sea, and uh, when once more within Palermo's wall, and seated on the throne in his great hall, he heard the Angelus from convent towers, and if the better word conversed with ours, he beckoned to King Robert to draw the wire, and with a gesture, gesture made the rest retire. And when they were alone, the angel said, Art thou the king? Then, bowing down his head, King Robert crossed both hands upon his breast and meekly answered him, Thou knowest best, my sins are scarlet are, and let me go hence, and in some cloister's school of penitence, across these stones that pave the way to heaven, walk barefoot till my guilty soul be shriven. The angel smiled, and from his radiant face a holy light illumined all of the place, and through the open window loud and clear they heard the monks chant in the chapel near, above the stir and tumult of the street. He has put down the mighty from their seat, and has exalted them of low degree. And through the chant a second melody rose like the throbbing of a single string, I am an angel, and thou art the king. King Robert, who was standing near the throne, lifted his eyes and lo, he was alone. But all apparelled as in days of old, with ermine mantle and with cloth of gold, and when his courtiers came, they found him there, kneeling upon the floor, absorbed, silent, 